Good afternoon. My name is Kees de Loof. I work for Van Oort. I work in the industry for more than 25 years in different roles. Um, I was an hour ago. I was called Dutcher than Dutch. <laughs> You'll notice that I'm rather clear, frank, direct, uh, and I think it helps. You've seen this. The, there's a legal and contracts compliance committee within IMCA. We have a purpose, we have a goal. Um, we aim for equitable solutions uh, between the parties in contracting. And then um, equitable solutions, in my mind, it means equitable for both parties, not only the employer or the developer or the financer behind those parties. We need to earn a buck as well, we the contractors. In the market, it was referenced uh, earlier today, there are several template contracts that um, were not written for offshore, offshore use. There's FIDIC, the, the Rainbow Suite, there's, uh, which is, they're all drafted for onshore building, construction, maybe a bit of installation, but they're plenty unsuitable for work at sea, where there's a harsh environment, uncontrollable environment, unpredictable environment, dangerous environment, all not accounted for in FIDIC contracts. There's also uh, NEC, also uh, a mainly shore-based uh, uh, type of contract, Yes, there is BIMCO and there's BIMCO supply time. That is aimed at work at sea, but BIMCO is really on, uh, aimed at maritime contracting. Rent a boat or uh, move a package or manage a vessel. Those type of contracts are generated by BIMCO. Plenty useful. Do not underestimate the, the, the use of that, but not geared for uh, the type of business that we are in at offshore energy. The practice today, uh, what we see is we have clients, they, they take plenty lots of time, starting with uh, a philic, usually philic based contract, they, they take plenty lots of time to tune it into what they think they need to reduce the risk, their risk, to zero, meaning to say that all the risk, if it's up to them, lies with the contractor. Doesn't really sound like fair and equitable. Um, it's we're looking for suitable suitable amendments of the contract in the, in the spirit of fair, equitable. Uh, contracting and what is actually worse, what we see happening is starting off with FIDIC, yellow or even silver, tune it into any, any, any contract that has zero risk for the employer. They take a year and very expensive lawyers to do that, to, to draft that contract and then give the, the contractor, I don't know, one or two months time to react on it, um, which is uh, not, not the best of practices if you look at fair contracting. So IMCA uh, spent plenty of time on contracting principles and decided to come up with a A, not D, not necessarily D solution to restore the balance, try and restore the balance. It's, uh, it's a first revision, it's a first draft the contract that IMCA has produced, Marine Transport and Installation or Renewables Contract. It's aimed at T&I only. Sounds a bit disrespectful, T&I only, because it's plenty difficult enough. Uh, but it is T&I. It doesn't cover uh, design, engineering. It doesn't cover fitness for purpose. 
It's TNI. Pick up some stuff over there. Put it over there. TNI. No more than that. <laughs> the renewables contracting principles they see on fair allocation of risk. Sylvia showed it just a, just a bit ago. Uh, fair, um, and we focus on allocation of risk. It says the party best placed to assume. What does that mean? Best placed means the party that decides, designs, engineers, fabricates, tests, should assume the risk in the item that is to be installed. Read the employer. Best place also means that there needs to be a balance between risk and reward. So yes, contractors are willing to take certain risk that they can manage, but they need a proper reward for that. There needs to be a balance and every now and then you have a, have a, have a blooper, you have a loss, but it must be balanced by projects that actually make a profit. There's a balance between risk and reward. So, dear clients, you need to pay up. This template contract, it's the first version. There, it, there's plenty of flaws in there, but we think it's a good start to get the discussion going, to, to provide a better alternative that's actually aimed at transport and installation, using a very big, expensive floating object called a vessel, it's a heavy investment and we need to earn that back. We need to make a margin. Here's a few, I'll, I'll touch upon them, uh, each of them. Here's a few of the changes compared to the current practice of Philip Yellow. The contractor should not take on a full performance obligation, but only a due care uh, and diligence obligation to finish the work. Why is that? Because, I just said it, the, the contractor is going to install stuff that he did not design, that he did not engineer, that he did not fabricate, and he is to, to pick that up and install that at a site that is uncontrollable, the soil conditions are with the client, the weather is unpredictable, so they're a due care and diligence obligation is fair, but not a full uh, completion obligation. Because there's so much control over the circumstances, not all control over the circumstances. Not to mention the fact that even in a TNI contract, the client is looking over your shoulder every half second, meddling with everything you do. So you just cannot take a full performance obligation. The latest key equipment availability date is a new concept in the, in the contract. And it relates to the fact that we work with scarce, expensive, high capex uh, issues that are in high demand. And a client can allocate a window to use that vessel. And yes, he may want to impose LDs on late completion, or fine, and yes, he may impose LDs on late start. But all that means that, dear client, this is your window. It happens in this window. And if we reach the end date, then the uh, contractor may have other commitments, so he needs to go. There is a latest vessel availability date. By the way, not only a vessel, but also a hammer or a trencher. Like the contractor, they rent a hammer, they rent it for a fixed period, that expires, so if there's delays at sea during the works, can happen, the, the contract, the rental contract, expires. And that hammer has a next project as well. So that's a big planning risk issue, if you want. And it can be managed if the, the master program of the client allows for proper float 
uh, and allows the contractor for proper time to do his job. A clean knock-for-knock -knock provision for liability and indemnity should be in a T&I contract. Um, well, I hope you all have heard about the, the advantages of knock-for-knock. -knock. It's uh, avoiding double insurance. Uh, it, it reflects better the balance of, of interest and risk in, in the value of the assets in place. But I, I'd like to say a bit more about one important spin-off of knock for knock as in it improves safety at sea. I've been a crew manager. I really, I really care for the people that work at sea. And they should be as safe as possible. And knock for knock is one component in there. Like if parties know, know that whatever happens, whoever is to blame, you still pay for your own damage, it means that you take extra, extra care for the process that nothing will happen. If I know that you may make a mistake, but I still pay, I keep a sharper eye on what you do for the sake of my people and for your people. So knock for knock is paramount, plenty maximum important to use at sea. And offshore wind employers need to start to understand that. It's people at sea. They risk their life for your revenue, dear employer. Getting emotional. <laughs> um, one other thing I wanted to mention is takeover of, of works completed. Uh, takeover should take place once the offshore work is complete of a monopile of a cable, but not only at the very last end. Because if you do the current practice, take over at final completion, administration, uh, the documentation, as bill documentation, everything, takes a whole lot of time. Um, the first monopile has been installed, I don't know, a year ago, being exposed to, uh, to the elements. But by that whole process, it ends up that it has a DMP, a defect notification period, of a year longer. That's not intended. That's not, not nice to contract it like that. So takeover is at completion of offshore works. And then, yes, there's, there's less build documentation everything. But the risk should transfer back to the employer the moment the work offshore is complete. Not on the slide, I'll, I'll mention one more thing. Um, the care of the works and the sites at sea is for the contractor. That's a general, well, often heard principle. I don't think that's fair. There's a huge wor work site out there. It's, it, it's square, I don't know, square meters, square miles, square, square, square kilo kilometers. Instead of this fitted concept, uh, that, that works for a building pit onshore that you can fence off yeah, and then you can have as a contractor you can have the care of the works and you can put a fence around it if you want you can put guard dogs in it doesn't work at sea so care of the works at sea I find that a, a very strange concept particularly even more so in the course of a TNI and uh, project scope there will be more than one contractor in the field. There's one for, for foundations, there's one for cables, there may be more, there may be a surveyor. How can one contractor have the care of the works at sea? It doesn't work. The risk should lie with the employer. And the insurers also need to understand that. It can't be the contractor taking that risk. There, there's a, uh, give me half a day and I can list you more differences between Fiddick Yellow and, uh, and this contract, but that's not the time I'm given. Thank you. <laughs>